few peas. So we are in the midst of this series. We're looking at different questions for several weeks, the Lenten season that Jesus asked. And this is one of the questions he asked the night he was on trial. It's not meant to be rhetorical. Why do you question me? And what happens here is actually something in my mind that as the more I dig into this passage and get deeper into it, it started in a sermon planning retreat back in December, putting this all together and knowing that this Sunday was going to be about coming to the altar, I, I get emotional about it. Because we know that this trial happened. We know that on Holy Week, Jesus was sentenced to something he was innocent of. That was his plan because he wanted to love us that much. And it's very hard for me to understand that, that somebody would want to do that. Even when I'm angry with them, I, I have to understand that he wanted to do that. And then I get into the narrative and I begin to see the hearts and the faces of the personalities of the people that deliberately on their free will decided to play roles in this week. It wasn't like God predestined them to be evil. God does not do that. These people decided they got to a point in life. That's where it was hard for me. They got to a point in life where they turned their faces on God. Folks, that is one ugly place to be in life. And we're going to take a look at what that looks like not to pick on them, not to say they're any worse or better than us, but maybe to learn from them. Before I pray, I want to talk and share a, a conversation that I had years ago with a good friend of mine. He wasn't at a point in life where he turned his face on God. He did not do that, but he was at a point in life where he looked at me and said, is it even worth loving God? Let me back up. That summer, he had gone through years before that a divorce and really began to long for a relationship with a person to fall in love with and begin another life together with. He thought he met a lady that summer that um, he truly fell in love with. And early in that summer, especially the month of June, not to... The relationship was building to that. Things were going wonderfully and months before that. And then out of nowhere, not to blame her because that wasn't the point, she decided the relationship needed to end. And he was empty because he truly loved her. To make matters worse, he was a manager at his work for a large corporation that summer also. And his position was managing a team. He was what you call a team manager. And he had about 15 to 18 people that were to work with him, and he was to oversee that team. About June and July of that summer, the team that he was responsible for began to deliberately backstab each other, and including him as a manager. And that became their mission at work more important than the project they were assigned to work on. And he was in an ugly place. He was a ringleader, he said sometimes, of I don't know what. Couldn't wait to get away from there because the backstabbing was real. All that to lead up to the first week of August, and him and I, with other adults and youth, were in the boundary waters. And we were sitting on the shores of Tin Can Lake, and we were, had camp set up. It was late afternoon, early, it was actually early evening. Uh, supper was over, the sun was setting. Some were fishing, some were tending to a fire, and him and I were sitting on a rock near the lake. And I knew him well enough where I knew what was going on. He had shared with me long before that. And he looked at me and he said, Bob, is it even worth it to have faith? He was in a tough spot. Let's pray. Lord, we are with Jesus today as we are invited to the altar. And Jesus is before the high priest who have deliberately and consciously decided they had enough of what could be or is the Son of God. And they have deliberately decided they were going to execute him.
Lord, help us understand not to go there and to learn from what that looks like so we get the signals in our life, Holy Spirit, and we know not to go there. Because in the end, that's an ugly place to be. It's a life of self-centeredness and selfishness. That's not how we want to spend eternity. So as we are invited, Lord, may it be an invite about grace, learning from these priests and growing closer to you, Holy Spirit, even when we question you. Let us know that we will do that and you love us. You love us. Constant. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, and help us hear you. And, and Lord, let the words of my mouth, Holy Spirit, not be mine, but yours, with gratitude, but humbly, but with expectation, Lord. Help us hear you. Help me hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I have a friend who's talking to me, and I don't know what the right words are to say because... I'm not interested in judging him. He was in a tough life. It was not fun for him to get up in the morning. It was not fun for him to get out of bed and go to work in the morning. It was not fun for him to come home to an empty house at night. And yet, in spite of his lack of energy to work at believing in the God who never stopped loving him, he figured it would be much worse to move further with that desire to a point where one could get and say, I'm done with you. And I want self-centeredness over this. Later that year, around December, he met another lady. Two years later, they got married. He also ended up with another job, and he's happily married now in the Midwest, has children, and he's through that season. He has smiled at me and said those seasons come and go every now and then, but I never give up. But what does it look like to become where the high priest had come? They have set up a desire to the point in their hearts where they have blocked out any possibility that Jesus Christ was God's son. They have decided in their lives that their lives were far more important, their money, their power, their prestige was far more important than the possibility of God in human flesh with them right there. There was no miracles in their life. There wasn't going to be any miracles because they have decided, God, I'm not letting that happen to me. And so we're going to look at what, what that might look like. And, and, and it's not because we want to pick on the high priest. It's not because we want to get angry. It's so we can learn and say, you know what? I don't want to go there, God. I don't want to end up at that way in my life. And I want to know the warning signs before I get there so I can kind of have a checkout system and say, I'm getting dangerously close to a bad place in life. And what do I do? I got to get some help. So I don't end up like they did. What does it look like? It looks like when, you, when someone gets to a point where they have said no to God and they have completely turned themselves into a self-centered world, it looks like they do everything in secret. The high priests have now for some months, if not a year, have decided to watch Jesus from a distance and make sure that they mark down everything that could possibly get him in trouble. They're watching him in secret. In fact, Jesus knows this. And he points it out to them as he's arrested that night and put on trial. The high priest questioned him. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues, in the temple, where all the Jews come together. Have I said nothing in secret? And their answer is, no, we got nothing on you. They didn't say that out loud, but that's what they're thinking. What do we do? We got nothing on them. We have watched them. We have tried. We've deliberately recorded things down, and we can't get anything on this guy. 
But we're going to continue because we are bent on getting it. You back up in this, this book, of this Gospel of John. Gospel of John is the one gospel that uh, introduces Lazarus being raised from the dead. And remember, Lazarus was brother to Mary and Martha. And he had been dead for several days. And Jesus is passing through their village on the way to Jerusalem for what was going to be Holy Week. And before he gets there, he stops at Mary and Martha's. And Lazarus is dead. And he raises Lazarus from the dead as recorded in John's gospel. And then later on, they have dinner together this man has been dead for weeks there's a stench in John's gospel he says the body smelled the tomb smelled and Lazarus is alive and what do the chief priests do in secret so the chief priests plan to put Lazarus to death as well since meaning as well as Jesus since it was on account of him Lazarus that many of the Jews were believing in Jesus. They're not interested in finding out this is the Son of God. They're more concerned about their money and their inheritance from those who they have gained the status of rabbi from and losing that money. They don't know the difference between self-centeredness and grace. And so in secret, they begin to live their lives. Meeting here and there and, and here for this uh, meeting and here for this meal. So we're in secret so nobody doesn't know what we're doing because we're on a mission. It gets worse. And this is the part that really hurts. These chief priests are role models in the community. People look up to them. They go to them for instruction. They go to them for getting questions answered. And they have been, they used to, thousands of years earlier, there was such a trust for the high priests in the Jewish religion that they never needed police to guard them. Because there was so much respect when you get back into the days of the Old Testament that they didn't need their own um, paid police force. But now it has gained a lot of lack of respect in that type of field of, if you want to call it, um, dignitary type of field. And it's gained so much lack of respect, the Roman uh, government had to assign police guard duty to them so that when they had their court rulings and their official rulings in the temple, they would not be mugged or mobbed or killed. So they had their own guard duty. And the chief priests are role models to these guards. If you remember, Pete was reading and Pete read there and Jesus said, why do you question me? And then the role model, the, the, the one looking up to the high priest saying, I'm going to be like you, goes and slaps Jesus across the face as hard as he can. And can't you just see him looking at that priest going, I'm there for you. I want to be like you. I'm not even upset with the guard. This is more about the high priest and the influence they're having on the lives of those around them than it is about this guard that wants to be a bully. This guard needs life and he needs love. And he's found himself in a bad neighborhood. And now his goal in life is really not when Jesus said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer a high priest? Can't you just see that guard looking at the high priest going, I did it. Are you happy for me? Because I want to be like you. This is not good. This is not a place that we want to go to. I'm not doing this to upset us. I'm doing this because we have to learn from this saying, I don't want to be there, Lord. Because there's times where we end up in our life where we question God, let's just face it. And we say, if you're there, I'd really like to know where you are because I really can't see you. Well, that's okay. We're going to do that. But the last thing we want to do is say, God, I'm done with you. And my goal is to get rid of you. So, let's turn the corner. How does Jesus react? And what can we learn from this? The guards slapped him across the face. 
And Jesus looks at the high priest, Ananias at this time, who is uh, the son-in-law of Caiaphas, where Jesus is going to go to next. There's an order of high priests. Ananias is lower than Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the highest of the high priests, kind of the highest of the judge uh, office position. Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? He isn't a doormat here. Don't get it wrong. He's not a doormat. But he's not grabbing that poor guard by the hand and saying, you do that again and it's going to be on you. He's not reacting at their level. And what can we learn from that? You know, the greatest thing about this whole Thursday night and Friday morning, I always remember this. I've said it before. I sound like a broken record, but I have to say it to myself so I can understand it. Jesus loves you and me more than we could ever love him. Jesus loves his guard. Jesus loves the priest. He's looking at Ananias going, you have so much more potential in your life if you can just get a grip on things. Don't go down this road, Ananias. But what happens here is Ananias decides, you know what, I want him dead because that's my goal in life, but I can't give him, you know, I can't come up with real evidence by Jewish law to kill him, so I'm going to pass him on to my father-in-law Caiaphas. So they get to Caiaphas. Now it's getting on to midnight. Caiaphas says, I want him dead because that's my goal in life, but I can't find any real Jewish law to convict him because he's not guilty of anything, so I'm going to pass him on to Herod. So Caiaphas gets Herod up at the Roman temple of that area of Jerusalem, <coughs> in the palace, excuse me, and Herod wakes up and says, what do you want me to do about it? This is your problem. You guys, this is your religion. You take care of it. And Caiaphas says, if we take care of it, there'll be a riot. And he just politically maneuvers a way to put it on Herod's shoulders. And eventually, Herod looks at it. And as we know the story, we have the hindsight of knowing the other side of the story. Herod gets the crowd, and, and, and the crowd with Caiaphas' help says, crucify him. And Jesus gets sentenced to a crucifixion. And Herod looks at Jesus at about 1 o'clock in the morning on Friday morning. And between him and Jesus, he looks at Jesus and he says, what is truth? And you and I are invited to the altar. And we're invited to ask that question to Jesus too. He wants us to ask that. He's ready to answer it. It's not truth with conviction or guilt. It's truth with grace. It is truth with grace. When I was 17 years old, I looked up at Jesus out there at the assembly grounds, and I think it was Hilltop Dorm, and I said, I am sick and tired. I don't know if I said it that direct, but I am tired of playing patty cake or religion. I want truth. And I never felt so loved in my life. I felt like a shower of God's love. I couldn't do anything else but cry and hang my hands up in the air and say thank you. That's all we need to ask. Jesus loved Pilate as much as he loves us. And we can learn and say, Lord, I don't want to be like those priests. It's not picking on them. It's not making them worse than we are. It's just saying the honesty of what we learned today. Don't let me go there. Grace is so much better. Am I going to question you, God? Yeah, I am. Am I going to ask, is it worth it at times? Yes, I am. But I don't want to go where they are. So as we come to the altar today, the choir is going to invite us with the gift of music. But let's just think about that. It's not about guilt. It's just saying, Lord, I've learned some lessons today. Help me with that. Help me with that. Not because I'm told to do it, but because I want to understand more about it. And I want to talk to you about it, God. In your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in prayer as we are invited.
Gracious Lord, you put a lot on that plate out there in just that short narrative of John's gospel. It's not that we're picking on the priests, we're learning from them. So Lord, help us today. Help us come to you and say, yes, we will question you. Yes, we will ask, is it worth it? But you will love us no matter what. Even when we ask, is it worth it? You love us. You do not turn your back on us. Do we turn our back on you? Yes, we do. But do you love us? Yes. So help us know that you never stop loving us. So that we can learn not to become like the priests, Lord. Invite us with grace and help us walk away in love with you deeper than where we are now. Are we in love with you now? Yes, but help us go deeper. In Jesus' name, amen. As I invite us forward to communion, I, I just want to point out that, you know, we're United Methodist, man. We want everybody to come. Every one of us is invited. There's no rites of passage. We're invited with the grace of Jesus Christ and a desire to follow Jesus Christ. And so as we come, the choir will give us the gift of music. And I just ask that we come by way of these, these side walls here. And then go to this altar. If we're able to physically kneel, kneel away. If we stand, stand. But just pray. Just say, Lord, I'm here. I'm yours. And I just want to be in love with you. I don't want to walk out of here alone. And then after some time and prayer to the gift of music, we just go down back to our pews by way of these center aisles. If you're unable to come for physical reasons, I can serve you in the pew. We're honored. Our servants will be honored to serve you. We just invite you up because there's just no restrictions whatsoever. And as we do that, I want to invite us into prayer. This prayer literally states that favorite statement of mine, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief.